will stand to, to your feet for the reading of God's Word. Philippians chapter number 1. We're going to start here about verse number 9. This may be something that you've never heard before, but with God's help, we're going to preach this out. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. While you're getting there this morning, I want to tell you to me, as a pastor, it is a privilege to be able to preach to people who... They love God's Word, no matter how it is. As long as it's God's Word, they love it. They love the sweetness of God's Word when it deals with mercy and grace, and they also love when it's a strong Word that brings conviction. Why? Because it is God's Word. What is likened unto the infallible Word of God? Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 9. If you have it, say amen. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be, say this word with me, sincere and without offense, Till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. I'd like to preach to you on the subject this morning of without wax. Without wax. Somebody say this with me. God doesn't want us to have wax. He wants us to be without wax. Stretch your hand to the Lord and let's pray one more time and ask God to just have his way. Father, we thank you for this service, this meeting of such precious people, your church, your bride, those who may be here this morning that don't know you, maybe those that once knew you. I'm praying, God, for the divine conviction that only comes through God, His Word, through the anointing. Praying, God, that you'll use me this morning in a very proficient way to speak to this congregation. And those who may be listening over the Internet this morning, we'll give you praise and all of God's people can say amen. Somebody look at the person by you and tell them this morning, if I got anything to do with it, I'll be without wax. Without wax. The book of Philippians, how many let me take my time this morning? The book of Philippians, it is an epistle, or as most of us down to earth folks know, it's a letter written by the hand of the Apostle Paul. It is believed to be written from a Roman prison cell where that Paul has occupied and been for quite some time. Paul writes back to the Philippian church, and his words were meant to convey his love to the Philippians. You know, when you study what happened with the, with the Philippian church, that their name is a little hard to pronounce sometimes because you'll get tongue-tied. The Philippian church was compassionate towards the needs of Paul. When Paul was going through the great struggle of being in prison, there are historical accounts that the people of the Philippian church were taking care of his necessities and supplying his needs while that he was in the Roman prison. They were doing their best to be uh, hospitable, if you will, and loving towards Paul while that he was being in prison by the Roman government. Paul also, as we read in this text, is giving them words of advice. I would say that if you thought about Paul and you think about the Philippian church, you would see Paul as a type of father figure or maybe a type of overseer. He writes to them to encourage them, to remind them how much that he loves them. He appreciates all that they've done for him. Not just that, but Paul goes on to give them advice to keep them strong in the faith and to be able to have a glowing testimony. The reality is is that just because you go down to an altar 
and you ask the Lord to come into your life and you give your life to the Lord, you confess your sins, the reality is is that the battle doesn't stop that day. The, the reality is, is that from day to day, you will still have to fight the, the adversity of the enemy. You'll still have to deal with spiritual wickedness in high places. But when you told God, I'll go all the way, when you ask him to come into your life, you have given him the proclamation that you're in this for the long haul. We understand that the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom is likened unto that of a marriage. You've made a commitment till death do us part. I am in this all the way. If you lose your legs in a car accident, I'm still with you, honey. If you put on a lot of weight, I still love you. I'll still be right by you. You'll still be my valentine. Say amen. Because the reality is, is that you are in this, no matter if it's good, it's bad, during the ups and the downs and the high times and the low times, you are in this till death do you part. Is there anyone this morning that says that when I made my decision to serve God, it was a till death do us part kind of commitment between me and the Lord? But you see, the Apostle Paul is dealing with this relationship that the Philippian church had with God. The reality is that Paul didn't know whether he would make it out of this jail. He didn't know whether one day to the next, as a matter of fact, that there is presumption that Paul had the idea that his life may be taken in some short time from that because of the charges that were against him for preaching the gospel. He didn't know from one day to the next. And I think of this in this oversight role that Paul is in, that this letter that he's writing to the church has a lot to do with a loving reply to the church to encourage them because he doesn't know whether he'll be there to walk with them. He knows he can't be there day to day when they live out their life before the Lord. And he wants them to be upright. He doesn't want to sow seeds into that ground and to be an encouragement to them and only watch them fall by the wayside. He wants them to make it. Do you know that God feels the same way about us? But Paul wanted them to make it. He knew there would be trials. He knew they would face stuff. But he wanted them to make it. And I think of Paul being like a, a father that maybe is on his dying bed. And he has last words that he wants to share with his family when they gather around that bed. Most of you would agree that if you knew that there was a loved one that maybe hospice has been called in and you're around that bedside and they've got words of advice and encouragement, you would think that whatever they have to say is going to be words that you will remember for a long time and they're important words and they, these are words that, they, that come a lot of times right from the heart. And though Paul was not laying in a deathbed, Paul understood what was before him and the potential that at any moment they could come in and take him to be stoned to death or any number of things in his life be taken. And so many of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote them with an encouraging tone to remind them you've got to, against all adversity, no matter what happens, you've got to keep the faith. You've got to stand in the face of hypocrisy and be the real church. Because in his day, it was not, it was just like it is today. There was no new thing. There were people that professed to be Christians, those that followed after Christ, but there began to be dissensions. There were people, some would say, I'm of Paul, as you read in the book of Corinthians, and others, others arguing, saying, I'm of Apollos. That would be like people today saying, Well, I'm of the independent movement, or somebody saying, Well, I'm of the Church of God, or I'm of the First Baptist of, you know, Second Street or whatever and so there was dissension and Paul had to come against that the greatest opposition was hypocrisy you see within the church the one thing you have to understand the devil cannot subvert the truth the truth will always be the truth so what the enemy likes to do is he likes to in just enough of faults and just enough of hypocrisy and just enough of the evil that it looks like the truth, but it's not really the truth. Say amen. If he can water it down just enough to make you believe it and make you accept it, then you have, because the truth, at the end of the day, a half lie is still a whole lie. Say amen. If it's not the truth, it's not the truth. Say amen. 
And so Paul dealt with this. When we read in verse 9, I'm just going to take three of these verses out of this chapter. When we read in verse 9, he expresses his desire that they grow in knowledge and in their ability to judge right from wrong and to be able to exercise judgment. How important that it is that as we serve God that we grow in knowledge of his word from day to day. I don't believe that God wants us to be the same as we were the day we got say it is the will of God that day by day that we progressively grow closer and tighter I don't know something happened to this microphone but I'm going to preach whether it hair lips hell anyway Amen. Praise God. And the truth is that Paul deals with the fact that these people need to exercise judgment from what is right and what is wrong. Is it not important to you and me that as a child of God that we're able to discern whether when a preacher preaches, whether he's telling us the truth, that if we have a new movement spring up, that we're able to identify the fake among the truth. Amen and to use discernment and that's what Paul encouraged them to do in verse 9 when he said I pray that you that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment he wasn't referring to the judging of one another so much as he was talking about being able to judge between what is good what is pure what is lovely what is holy how many of you know that if you're going to serve God you need to have the ability to look at something and know whether that's a defiled thing, whether it's ungodly, whether it's something forbidden by the word of God. Say amen. Not only that, but in verse number 10, he encourages them to only allow that which is excellent in their life, that which is pure, that which is holy. And he encourages them in this, that they do it all the way to the end. In verse 10, this is exactly what he said, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you be sincere and without offense uh, till the day of Christ. I want you to be the real deal. Don't be a fake. Don't be a false. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a phony. And don't just serve God for a little while and then cut out of the race. Don't try to uphold the word for a little while and then start compromising the word. But hold tight to the truth. All the way to the very last day of serving God. Are you feeling what I'm saying? And then in verse number 11, he reminds them of the necessity of bearing the fruits of righteousness which come through Christ and when they bloom, they bring glory and honor to God. He said these exact words, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Do you know that your life can become a perfume? It can become like a fragrance that fills the room and the glory of God fills your life and people are able to see the fruits of righteousness because you are living by the word and your testimony becomes bright and shining before those around you and Paul says being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Do you know that God gets praise when mamas raise their children right in the admonition of God. Daddies uh, bring praise to God when they raise their children right. Uh, Marriages bring praise unto God when they're tight knit and they have uh, given all and sacrificed all and submitted and surrendered all to Christ. Can you say man? But there is one word uh, in the text this morning. I know some of you are curious and you're wondering what in the world does that little pot have anything to do with anything. Well, with the Lord's help, I'm going to preach something maybe you've never heard before. But there's one highlighted word in our text this morning that I want you to see. In verse 10, when Paul said that you may approve things that are excellent, he went on to say that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ. The highlighted word here is sincere. Now, sometimes we may read God's word and we may gloss right over the powerful content of sometimes just one word. And this
this word is a powerful meaning behind it because in the original Greek for the word sincere, it appears to say helicrines, but it is not pronounced that way. It is pronounced illacrines. It is a two-part word. The first part of the word is hyel, which means sun rays, and the second part being krino, which means to judge or to call into question. It meant, in other words, uh, in the original Greek language, uh, to be judged by sunlight uh, and to be tested to be genuine. You see, in the in the Latin, if you'll follow me, I'm going to preach to you this morning. In the original Latin word that you and I use as sincerity, in the original Latin language from years ago, there is two words, uh, and it is sincera. Somebody say that with me this morning, sincera. Say it again, sincera. In the original Latin, it was the word sincera. It is the basis behind the word we use in our English language, sincerity. So it would bear to make sense that when the translators, they read the original manuscripts in Greek, that they translated that original word in the Greek language to the word sincerity. Because the word sign or sin, it means without. Somebody say without. Sarah means wax. So in other words, when the original interpretation of the word in the Latin, it meant without wax. Somebody say without wax. So you see, there are two different historical explanations to believe behind this word that we call sincerity and in the Latin, which would be sincera. It deals, first of all, the first belief in historical understanding Standing was that with the extraction of honey, when it is without the wax from the honeycomb, that it is in its purest form. So whenever people would say that it is sincera uh, honey, it meant that it was without wax. It did not have the wax of the honeycomb, uh, that golden brown liquid that flowed down. It was in its purest form uh, when it had no contaminants, uh, when it was without the wax. Uh, the second understanding in our historical uh, revelation is this, that this word sincera, it was the basis behind uh, a trend or a historical movement back many years ago during the Roman Empire when people would make figurines uh, and they would make vases or pots for water pots uh, or brick making and such as that. There was this understanding uh, that a lot of times when these bricks were made and when these pots were made, that sometimes as the manufacturing heat and process would show up, uh, they, they would have cracks in them. They would have imperfections uh, in the pot, imperfections uh, in the bricks that they made, uh, imperfections in the idols and figurines and such as that. And they were many times, uh, they were too lazy and they were too cheap and they, they would pass these imperfect products off to those who did not understand understand and did not know what they were buying. It would be the equivalent of today. You going and buying a knockoff coach purse uh, or you buying a knockoff Gucci purse uh, or Levi's or whatever. And so it was not what you thought that it was. The imperfections of what they would do is they would take wax and they would heat wax up and they would put wax in the cracks of the bricks, wax in the cracks of the pots and wax in the, in the cracks of of the pottery that they made and so they would cover them over and color them in such a way that when they put them on the marketplace shelf that when somebody would come by and they saw that pot they would look at it and think that it was a good pot they would buy it take it home and then as they began to use it they would re realize uh, that this pot has got cracks in it and the water would leak out of the pot it was of no real use uh, and so people began to get wise uh, to that trickery and so what they began to realize uh, is that that sincere or that without wax what that means is uh, is that that pot does not have any wax covering over its imperfection in other words what they began to get wise enough to do is they would hold the water pots up to the sunlight 
why. Hence the reason why that I told you in the original Greek uh, that it was a two-part word, first being hyl, which means sun rays, uh, and krino, which means to judge or to call into question. They would hold the pot up to the sunlight and they would turn it around because in the sunlight, when the light was shed across that pot, they were able to see the little lines and imperfections uh, and whatever that they saw, they would be able to distinguish, uh, maybe dig their finger in and realize uh, they're trying to hide something. Somebody say, don't try to hide anything from God. Well, I'm going to tell was uh, is that they filled those cracks full of wax uh, Anyhow, so what they would do is they filled those cracks full of wax and others got wise to what they were doing wrong and they saw what the problem was and so whatever that they held up to the light which was not revealed by the light, they would put it up into the sun that the heat from the sun would heat up the wax and the wax would melt out of the cracks because nobody wants to be fooled into trickery. Somebody say, Amen. How many of you be upset if you went to the market, bought mama a good vase to put her roses in, got to the house, got to put water in the vase, and the water leaked all over the counter? You'd be pretty upset. Somebody say amen. And so what they did, they began to do something unique. Uh, over a period of time, there would be people that would manufacture bricks and pottery, and they would put a signet on the bottom of the bricks and the pottery, and it would say, Sin Sarah. In other words, that that insignia or that impression on the bottom of that pot would say sincera, which means without wax. So in other words, it was a guarantee to the one that picked it up to buy it that you don't have to worry. There ain't no wax in here. You don't have to worry when you take this pot home, when you take that water pot home, it's going to hold water. Say amen, somebody. Praise God. When you take that water pot home, it's going to hold water. When you take that brick home and the weight is applied to that brick, it's going to hold the weight. Praise God. I tell you what, technology is great when it works. I got it, Sister Myers. We good now. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach this thing out whether the devil like it anyway. Hey, Amen. Somebody say get it, Brother Myers. All right, I'm going to. Come on now. So whenever they, whenever, <laughs> thank God, whenever they would hold that pot up, they began to realize uh, that the makers began to put sin Sarah, meaning there ain't no wax here. You ain't got to worry about that at all. So whenever I look back to what the writer Paul said uh, in the original text here, he said that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere. In other words, that you may be sincere that you may be without wax, uh, that I'm not trying to cover up anything in my life. Uh, somebody say amen, uh, that there is nothing in my life that I'm trying to cover over or to hide over. Somebody say amen. Uh, and so uh, the interesting connection uh, that I see with this uh, is that what they were trying to cover over, somebody say blemish. Sometimes I look in the mirror and see a lot of them, especially the older I get. Come on now. But the connection that I saw is simply this, that in the original, that just like the Old Testament, there are profound uh, inclusions in the Word all throughout the Old Testament where that one of the key things that God was concerned about is that when you offered a sacrifice on the altar offered up a sacrifice before God. In other words, it was to be without spot or I'm beginning to feel like preaching. It was without spot or without blemish. He said, in other words, when you offer up a lamb, it can't have a broke back leg. You can't you can't bring in here a turtle dove that's got a messed up wing. You've got to bring in something that is that is without imperfection. 
Can you say amen? You see, the good news is this, that the ultimate sacrifice was paid by none other than the greater sacrifice offered by Jesus Christ. Do you understand this morning uh, that when Jesus died on the cross, that he was without somebody say blemish? He was a, like a lamb led to the slaughter. Uh, that lamb that was offered up on Calvary, that lamb with, was without spot, he was without blemish, and without wrinkle in his sacrifice. Uh, and that one sacrifice uh, was paid for the atonement of our sins uh, and through the redemption of his we have forgiveness of sins. Uh, but you see, the key is, uh, and a lot of people miss this, uh, from the day that you gave your life to God, the day you gave your life to God, he has washed your sins away. Somebody say, thank God. The day you gave your life to God, he forgave you. Somebody say, thank God. But from that day forward, you have an obligation to keep yourself unspotted, uh, to keep yourself without wrinkle, and to keep yourself without blemish. Uh, Pastor Myers, have you got Bible to back it up? Yes, sir. In the book of James chapter 1 and verse number 27, he said, pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In other words, uh, pure religion undefiled. One of the things is uh, to keep yourself unspotted, uh, to keep those blemishes out of your life, uh, to live up right before God, somebody say man. From that point forward, you have an obligation. And just like it's written in the book of Ephesians, uh, we are to one day present, be presented as a bride. Uh, Ephesians 5 and 27 said that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Uh, somebody say we are supposed to be holy and without blemish. Uh, listen and I know uh, that a lot of people would rather hear you preach a message uh, that validates their ability to just keep living in open sin. But God said, come out from among the world and be your separate people, saith the Lord, and I will receive you unto myself. I feel the Holy Ghost. When those brick makers put that insignia or that inscription on the bottom of a pot or a brick, it was to let the buyer know this pot will hold water. This pot's not going to leak all over your counter. You're not going to fill a water hole and fill up full of water and get back home and have no water. Those bricks that you're buying, when you start using them as building material, and the weight of the brick above it, and the weight of the brick above that, and the weight kind of comes down on that brick. You ain't got to watch your house falling down. How many of you know that if you build your house on sinking sand, you're going to sink? But if you build it with stuff that's solid, you're going to make it. But I'm going to tell you somebody this morning, uh, as much as I hate the devil and everything he might try to do to subvert this message, uh, there are some of you that have been needing to hear this for a long time. And here it is right now because you need to understand that God loves you, but the love of God's so good that he says just like in the book of Revelation, he said, them that I love, them that I love, them that I love, I chase them, I rebuke them. He said, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Listen, if if you're living one way, one day, and another way, another day, you need to get your heart right on the altar of God. You need to lay your life down before God. Stop being a hypocrite. Lay your life on God's altar and say, God, watch me thoroughly. Purge me of my sinfulness. God, get me out of the sin business. Somebody say, help the pastor this morning. There are distinguishable characteristics about sincere people. Brother, have you got my normal mic muted? If not, check it. Check, make sure it's muted. There are distinguishable characteristics about sincere people. There are certain things about them that are identifiable traits of sincere people. You can tell when somebody's sincere is what I'm saying. One of the identifiable characteristics of sincere people they have nothing to hide. I'm not worried. If you get a hold of my phone, 
as much as I believe that it's my private thing, just like my wife's purse, it drives me crazy when you people going around getting into other people's stuff that drives me nuts but I got nothing to hide there's nothing for me to try to cover over I've met people before they don't want the pastor to come to their house why is there something that shouldn't be there have you got wax in the cracks of your life are you trying to cover over stuff that should not be there listen let me tell you something folk when you serve God with all of your heart you ain't got nothing to hide you ain't worried about it let me tell you something I ain't nobody if you wouldn't want me to walk in your front door, sit down in your living room, find out you got fireball liquor in the cabinet, uh, and find out you got stuff in your house that shouldn't be there, then guess what? I'm going to tell you, God is much greater than the preacher, and he sees, uh, he knows, uh, and he cares. Uh, he knows what's going on when ain't nobody around. Uh, whenever your life's right, you got nothing to hide. Come on in. Ain't nothing here for you. I ain't got nothing to hide. Somebody say, God, help us not try to hide anything from you. It didn't work out too well by, the well, by, by, by a man by the name of Achan. The Bible showed us that they were in battle. They had been winning battle after battle after battle. But then there came a day when all of a sudden they started losing. And they're trying to understand. We're serving the great God. There's no reason for us to lose unless somebody say there's sin in the camp. Sin in the camp could be sin in the church. Somebody say sin in the church. Sin in the camp could be sin in your marriage. Somebody say sin in the marriage. Sin in the camp could be sin in your house. Somebody say sin in the house. But it didn't work out too well for Achan. Because Achan had stole a wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment and hid it under his tent floor. And you know what happened? The man of God, Joshua, came along and Joshua filed it down until he found out it was in Achan's house. He stood before Achan and he looked at Achan. He says, Achan, give God the glory. Achan couldn't give God the glory because Achan was hiding something. Achan had cracks in his life, smeared over with wax. Somebody say he wasn't sincere. There was something wrong in his life. He was hiding something. But he died. Not only did he die, his whole family, somebody say his family died. His family died. Don't think for one minute that you can't take your whole family down with your foolishness. You can't destroy your marriage with your foolishness. Don't think for one minute that you can't destroy your children's reputation by your foolishness. Somebody say, God, let me be without wax. Sometimes you got to lay yourself out before God. As I studied this last night, boy, this came across my spirit and I thought to myself, you know, if you marry someone, you better hope to God if you met or some, marry someone, you're not getting a painted up problem. After you don't get married, then you find out afterwards there's some cracks smeared in and full of wax. That ain't what I thought. It's not sincere. Listen, folk, you got a pastor trying to make sure that you're ready, just like Paul was trying to make sure the Philippians were ready. He said that you be sincere all the way to the end. Don't find yourself partway in this race trying to fake it to make it. Not only is it a distinguishable characteristic of those uh, that are sincere, that they have nothing to hide, but sincere people are the same all the time. Pastor, you mean we can't have good days and bad days? I'm not, that's not what I'm telling you. I know it's not what I'm telling you. Sincere people are the same all the time. If you see them at church, they're going to be the same if you see them out on the job site. <laughs> not that I got my church attitude on Sunday, but I got my, I, I got my world attitude on Monday. I don't have two different attitudes. If you see me in church, you see the same person here as you do out there. If you see me on a job site, 
you're going to see the same attitude. I'm sincere. You see, God loves us enough to correct us and chastise us and tell us, look, there are cracks in your vase and you're trying to smear it over like everything's all right. But God said, you need to get it right. Somebody say amen. Whenever you are sincere and you're same all the time, you don't have a church mask and a fit in with the crowd mask. Put on my church mask. Whenever I get out in the world, I'm going to put on my fit in with the crowd mask. I don't see any young people in here. I don't really see maybe somebody, but you go to school and you ain't the same at school as you are in church. Come on. Your church mask, your church swag, your church walk, your church talk, your church lingo. How many of you know this morning that whenever you live like that, Guess what happens when heat is applied to the wax? The cracks are exposed. That's why people don't like it gets down to where they're living. They'd rather you preach on love and grace and all that. Love, peace, and chicken grease. They'd rather you preach all the flowery stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm just one of those. Maybe I'm preaching. Maybe you feel the same way. I'm one of those. Every, every once in a while, I need the preacher to get where I'm living at and remind me if there's something hypocritical in your life, baby, you need to get rid of it. You need to get that out of your life. Just like two kings can't sit on the same throne, you bring mess into your house that don't belong there. You let things go on in your life that don't belong there. You let stuff come across your radio station that should not go on there. You let things go on through your earbuds. You let things go on in your, in your life that should not be there. God's not wanting you to live one way on Sunday and another way the rest of the week. God said if there's wax in your cracks when the heat is, is applied, when the preaching of the truth gets hot, a lot of times that wax melts out of the crack and then all of a sudden there you stay and you're trying to, oh God, I realize uh, that I got some problems uh, and just like the original Greek language, uh, when the light was revealed, uh, light reveals there's wax in the crack. Light reveals that there's a blemish. Uh, light reveals that your intentions are not as pure and as holy as they ought to be. Somebody say, thank God for the light. You don't talk one way in church and another way outside of church. How many of you know that there's almost like a church lingo? I've been preaching so long, so many messages, literally, I don't know, probably thousands of messages, that sometimes my daily talk, I'll use words that are from the Bible, and my kids will be like, Dad, I can tell you're a preacher. Just normal conversation. You know what I'm saying? But your talk when you are in church should match the same kind of talk when you're outside of church. Oh, yeah. How many of you know that the Bible still says we're supposed to have chaste, somebody say chaste, conversation coupled with fear. Fear that I might say something not pleasing to God or fear that I might ruin my testimony. Boy, I know this ain't popular preaching, but praise God anyhow. <laughs> Sincere people are the same all the time. There ain't anything they can't do in church that they can do in public. If you can't do it in here, you might want to rethink what you think you can do out there. Well, I just pull right up in the church, tell my nasty jokes, talk about everybody. I've met people before that have told me they said they're afraid to do certain things in church. How many of you know this is a building? that we recognize as a place of fellowship where God's people come together to worship God. But God is omnipresent. So whenever you're sitting on the back porch on the phone in a lustful affair conversation with somebody you ought not be in, if you can't have that conversation here, you shouldn't be having that conversation out there. 
If you can't act like that out there, then you sure shouldn't be in here. You sure shouldn't be acting like that out there. Say amen, somebody. You see, I believe that a lot of times that we almost have this perception that church is the type of place that we, we we're supposed to kind of confine ourselves and do right. But once we walk out the door, that's a whole different story. But that is like bringing a pot into the church with cracks in it, smearing wax into all the cracks, uh, and trying to appear as though that everything is all right. A little couple words of prayer on the altar, but never really dealing with the cracks that are there, never surrendering to God. Let me tell you, we are dealing with a day in the church when there are actually people within the church that are dealing and battling with spirits of perversion. Some of them are battling with all sorts of lying spirits. Some of them are demon-possessed. Some of them are bordering on the on the cuff of being oppressed by demonic spirits and yet come into the church. And let me tell you what's a sad indictment on the church is when we're always preaching flowery, flowery messages uh, and people come into the church and they need deliverance from the cracks that are smeared over. They've come in with their church mask on and they leave with the church mask Oh, and they never get under conviction. Let me tell you what conviction will get you in the altar. Conviction will get your heart right. Conviction will reveal everything that's there that ought not be there. Somebody say, God, I don't want to be like that. God, let me be a vessel that is pure and holy and undefiled before God. You need to understand this morning, he's not just looking to fill in the cracks with wax on Sunday and you going back to being openly broken on Monday, there's a distinguishable difference, not just with sincere people, but with unsincere, unsincere people. Unsincere people. I, I'm just going to say this because it's important, and I know that everybody here is not in ministry, but some of you have experienced things, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But people that are in ministry that are unsincere they are very little help to the ministry because when they leak, they often cause more damage than they did to help. You put somebody in a position that's not sincere, and they can cause more havoc and damage than they do help because those wax-filled cracks, when the heat gets hot, when trouble comes, when there's problems and issues and trouble and trial. The wax melts, and the truth reveals. Another distinguishable characteristic about an unsincere person, unsincere person is that they will eventually leak when heat is applied. I've heard people say before, that slipped. It slipped. Sunglasses on here. Grandma, Grandpa, Mamas and Daddies, when your church, when your children hear you speaking in tongue one day, cussing them out another day, you're not without wax. People see that. And they lose respect in that. Because the reality this morning is, if it's in there, eventually it will come out of there. If I took this pot right here, smeared some wax on the cracks that were in it, it may hold water for a little while. When the hardships of life come down on it, people start talking about you. When problems arise and the wax starts dripping out of it, whatever's in there will come out of there. If there's unholy in there, unholy is coming out of there. I understand that any one of us this morning can be tempted, tried, and I mean the devil knows how to turn up the fire hotter than it's ever been. Say amen. 
He knows your great weakness. He knows what will get you flared up. There's some of you this morning that have maybe had a bad temper in your life, and you know the enemy knows the hot buttons to push to get you to that point. Sometimes I believe that when God turns up the heat and allows something to happen in your life, it is so that the wax starts melting out of the cracks that you have waxed over so that he can reveal the weak areas of your life so that you can say, God, I got some things I need to work on. I'd much rather have a service like today and say, God, I'm too near the end of this journey. I'm too near the end to be lost. I'm too near the end of this journey to hear depart from me, you worker of iniquity. God, if you would, put me on that potter's wheel today and get this vessel back on there. God, put the right things back in there. Patch these cracks up like they're supposed to be. Get me back on that wheel and work on me in a way to transform me back to where I should be. God, I got some weak areas. Uh, Instead of getting mad at God, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost to tell somebody. Instead of getting mad because the preacher preached down your alley, because the preacher preached the truth and it hurts. Uh, Instead of getting mad, say, thank God. Uh, You've shown me I got some areas I need to work on. Amen. There's some things I've got to change. Uh, When you finally get to that place, uh, God can say to you, I realize uh, you're going to let me put you on the wheel. You're going to let me turn the wheel. You're going to let me form and fashion you. But as long as you keep concealing it, uh, as long as you keep hiding it, uh, God can't help you until you're willing to come clean, uh, until you're willing to say, I got a problem. Uh, God, I need a remedy, and I need to be fixed. I'm going to go as far as to tell you something this morning. The reality is, as a pastor, I have a, a great deal more respect for people who are not fake and they're just who they are. What, what kind of thing you mean? Well, I used to preach it like this. I'm just going to say this. I've been around a church and I've heard and seen a lot of things over the years. And I've seen people that were sitting in the church and they're looking to nitpick other people that walk in the church. Oh, dear God, look at that mini skirt. Look at she looks, oh, God. Instead of minding your business about what God's doing in your life, you're looking for a problem in somebody else. But this is what I want to tell you. This is what I want to tell you. I'm not as bothered by the people who are what they are as the ones that are often nitpicking that got junk that they're hiding in the background that nobody don't know about. Oh, you could pick somebody clean. You could pick somebody apart. You bring your ro- your ruler to church. You bring your ruler everywhere you go. You're going to measure everybody. But yet you don't want nobody to know some of the mess you've been doing that don't nobody know about. Come on and say amen. You wouldn't want nobody to know that you cheat time on the time clock when ain't nobody paying attention, that you lied on your taxes this year. You don't want nobody to know some of the mess you've been doing, uh, but yet you want to pull out your yardstick on everybody else. Uh, listen. If you got cracks filled with wax, get yourself on the altar and say, God, do a divine work in me. I'm going to come clean. I'm going to stop being angry about it. I'm just going to confess because confession, let me tell you, if you confess with your heart, with your mouth, God will give you forgiveness. Amen. Lord, there's some things, there's some thoughts, there's some ways, there's some things I do that Those closest to me, they know all about. I want you to understand that Pastor Myers does not come here this morning with a bull whip. I have not placed myself on a pinnacle to look down my nose on anybody. That is not the purpose of this kind of preaching. But this is to help you just like Paul. Listen, honey, you've got a race before you. And you want to be ready when you get to the finish line. But I'm afraid that there's a lot of people that are sitting on church pews. They're being entertained with the fact that the music is good. They're being entertained by the idea and the the solace. Well, I, I went to church today. But how many of you know you can go to church and church not be in you? Well, I sat on the pew. Mamas and daddies, we celebrate the idea when we find out our lost children went to church. We celebrate the idea that our grandchildren decided to go to church. Amen. 
But let me tell you, at the end of the day, when you want to see me celebrate, it's whenever I see that they're, they're getting sincere and they're not just going and sitting on a pew, but church has got inside of them. The holy God of heaven's got inside of them because at the end of the day, when you hold it up to the light, the light will reveal the true test of whether it's sincere. I'd love for God to be able, I'd love for the world to be able to pick me up. Amen, examine my life. Is that Bible, Brother Myers? Yeah, because the Bible says If a man desires the office of a bishop, he must be blameless. That means you can't find, amen, a bunch of junk in his life that ain't tested genuine. I'd like for the world to look and say, yep, sincere. Somebody say, yep, sincere. In other words, amen, I'm not talking about he's not a walk in Christ, but he is walking like Christ. Say amen, somebody. He is that that image of Christ in the world. He's a man of God. She's a woman of God. They are sincere. They are in this thing for the right reason. Honey, in a day when we've got so many preachers prophesying to people, finding out that they are doing things they shouldn't, living in million and billion dollar houses and homes and flying in these man, uh, fancy jets and everything. I ain't got a problem with you flying in a, in a nice jet, but I want you to know something. God never intended a minister or any church leader to live in such a fashion when there are souls on the mission field dying lost, when there's people out there that are in need, and yet you're going to live a high on the hog off a of senior citizen's social security check and everything else. Let me tell you, hey man, I believe God will give us a modest living. He'll take care of us but I don't believe God ever intended us to be like that we're either sincere or we're we're not wax in the cracks of the vessel covered over nobody don't see nobody don't know I have a real problem with my temper I'll smear some wax over here. I don't have a problem with the fact that you may have issues and imperfections because if you're willing, you can put them on the altar. The problem is when we live hypocritical lives and we're just comfortable to smear a little wax on the outside as to appear that everything is all right. I was having a conversation with someone just recently. I'm about to close here. And I said, it would surprise you if you knew some of the mess that goes on in some people's lives and in their houses in secret, you don't know nothing about. But how many of you know this morning there's nothing secret to God? There's nothing hid. When you hide the drugs from the rest of your family, God knows your hiding place. When you sneak around getting you a little sip here and there while you're telling everybody else you're clean, God knows where you're doing it. When you get on the Internet and you do things you shouldn't, God knows where you're going. Come on, say amen. He knows when you put on a front and do the church religious thing when on the other hand, it's a mess. Somebody say without wax. Stand to your feet this morning. I want to read you what Paul said as we close. Paul said in verse 10, that you may approve that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. I want you to be true all the way so that when you stand before him in the day of judgment that you'll hear, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. The good news is we serve a compassionate and a merciful God this morning. 
who loves you enough to let heat and hot trials and temptations of life to expose the weak areas of our lives so that he can say, bring it to me. Let me work on it. Let me fix it. Let me deal with it. You want my mercy and you want my grace, but I want you to be sincere. You want me to forgive you, but I want you to be sincere with me. Don't be fake. Don't hide anything. Be the same everywhere you go. If you can't do that whenever you're in church, and you might want to reconsider what you're doing outside. If you can't talk like that around that preacher, you might want to reconsider how you talk when you're around other people. I mean, this morning says, I still believe in being sanctified. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm giving you an opportunity this morning to come to this altar. Come onto this altar this morning. Put your all before God. Come to this altar and lay everything before the Lord. Come to this altar and be honest with God. Lord, I need you. Lord, I got to have you. I need your purpose. This sincerity.